Have you ever read half of a great book and then just decided, nah? Or watched half of a great movie or a great ball game and just thought, that's not really worth it. All of you have a great Easter meal planned for tomorrow. Are you going to eat half of it? Or if you've got kids of any kind, grandkids going around, you're going to hide eggs. Are you going to find them all or just find a few and quit? I believe that there's something in us that doesn't want to do anything halfway. And at the same time, I'm totally convinced that if we're not careful, we do exactly half of the Easter message and never get to the second and most important part. And that is what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm Dan Sutherland, one of the pastors at Westside. Welcome to number three of 12 services that are happening around the Kansas City area. A couple up at Lansing, a couple over at Speedway, eight here at Lenexa this weekend. And welcome also to all of you that are joining us on the internet. Happy Easter. I caught you off guard. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, Happy Easter. It is a phenomenal thing that happens this weekend when 2 billion, check out the number, 2 billion Christ followers around the globe celebrate the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're doing tonight. We're also continuing part four of our series on rethinking church. For the last few weeks, we've been saying, what are the first century truths that we have fallen away from when we think about the 21st century church? It's been a fun journey. We talked about the fact that church is not a destination. It is a mission. It is the people of God being filled with and used by the Spirit of God to accomplish the mission of God. We looked at the fact that God's plan is to partner with us as Christ followers to win the world. We looked last week at the idea of unity in mission, but diversity in expression. And right now, I want to encourage you, find your notes. You don't get off because it's Easter. Wave them at me. We are note takers. If you've never tried it, Easter's a great time to jump in and give it a shot. Here's the big idea for tonight's teaching. The message of the church is salvation through the cross. We get that part, but it's also power for life through the empty tomb. It is not just the cross. Now, the cross is major. It is the place where we celebrate the death of Jesus Christ, his sacrificial giving of himself. But it's not the whole story. Really, the message is salvation in the cross and power for living through the empty tomb. And the second piece of the, the teaching for tonight is God wants to recharge his church through the power of the resurrection. I wonder from time to time, when God looks at his church today, what does he think? I think he'd like to see us gear it up. I think he'd like to see us take it up. I think he'd like to see us not only experience salvation in the cross, but powerful living because of the resurrection. Write this in. Easter is a two-part play. It's a two-part play. Now, I'm not really a play kind of person. But if you went to a play and you paid good money for the tickets, would you leave after Act 1? Only if there's a good ball game on TV. Otherwise, you're staying. You're checking out the whole thing. Well, the first act is the cross. It's the crucifixion. Write that in. But the second act, equally important, is the resurrection. And I grew up in a church tradition that emphasized the crucifixion but just kind of left out the resurrection. In fact, we did things like Lent, where you give up something coming up unto Easter, coming up unto the crucifixion. We did Holy Week in the church where I grew up. We did something called Monday Thursday that I thought for years was Monday Thursday, and that was really confusing. We did services on Good Friday night, and then we get to Sunday and kind of go, oh yeah, and then he was raised. Big emphasis on the cross, not a whole lot on the empty tomb. It is both and. And that's what I want us to talk about tonight. It's both and. Have you experienced salvation in the cross? Big question. But are you experiencing resurrection 
in the empty tomb in what Jesus has done for us. Write this in. 21st century Christianity, I really believe this is a true statement, is infatuated with the cross while largely ignoring the tomb. Think about it. We're infatuated with the cross. Some of you tonight have a cross on your ears. Some of you are wearing it on a necklace around your neck. That's awesome. Some of you have it tattooed on your arm. Some of you are going, I'm three for three so far. <laughs> Many of us have a T-shirt that's got a cross on it. The New Orleans Saints professional football team has a cross on their helmets. If you haven't noticed that, next time they play, if they ever play again, Check that out. We're infatuated with the cross, but we just largely ignore the tomb. What is the deal? The deal is we're only doing half of Easter, only doing half of Jesus' message, only honoring half of what he has done for us. I believe we have been guilty of emphasizing God's power, write this in, to save our souls but we have largely ignored God's power to change our lives. In fact, I think a lot of Christ's followers find it easier to trust Jesus with their eternal destiny than with their everyday stuff. Doesn't that seem backwards? It's kind of like we say, hey, God, I got the salvation deal going. I'll run my life now. I got heaven figured out. I'll manage the earthly part. I've got my life insurance intact. I'll run my marriage and my parenting and my career and me. You just kind of hang out in case I need you. That is not the message of Jesus. It is not the message of Easter. It must be both and. So I want us to focus tonight on one question. What does God say about his power in our lives? What does he say about his power in our lives? Why are we not living powerful, Christ-centered lives? And we're just going to kind of survey through what the Scripture says about the power of the resurrection. A lot of Scripture tonight. Follow along. Jesus said, I have come that you might have a really tired and run-down life. Oh, I messed it up that you might have and enjoy life and have it in abundance, I love this, to the full till it overflows. Look this way. A lot of Christ followers run low all the time on spiritual fuel. The power meter in our lives is way down here. Jesus says, I didn't come for you to live down here. I didn't come for you to be half full or three quarters full. I came for you to be so full that it overflows. I want to demonstrate this. You can do this with me. I want you to think of the most joyful person you know. Now, the most joyful person you know, and if you're thinking it's me, think of somebody else. Okay? Don't think of yourself. Think of the most joyful person you know. The person that when you're around them, it lifts you up. The person that when you hang with them, their laughter spills into your soul. Their joy gets into your character. I mean, you just, it's just a joy to be with them. Do you have that person in mind? You got somebody like that? Write their name in your notes right there by that verse. Somebody who overflows with Jesus. They overflow with joy. That is a piece of the power of the resurrection. That's an example that if we are really full of Jesus, living everything he's called us to, really living like we're dying, then the reality is we have power for joy. We don't have to work it up. It's there. It's there. But it's not just power for joy. It's also power for strength. Love this next verse and particularly love it in the amplified translation that's there in your notes. I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. Check this out. I am ready for anything. Circle ready for anything. Wow. Is that an approach to life? I'm ready for anything, and I'm equal to anything. Circle that. Equal to anything. Why? Because I'm a wonderful person, right? No, because I've got the strength to do it. No, through him who infuses inner strength into me. I want you to think of another person right now. I want you to think of the strongest person you know. I mean, they're just strong. I'm not talking about this kind of strong. That would be me. 
I'm talking about strong. I mean, nothing gets to them. They just keep going. They seem to have strength when everybody else runs out. They seem to have power when everybody else has run down. Do you have that person in your mind? Jesus wants to give us that kind of strength. Now, why is that a big deal? Here's why. There's a rough stretch coming in your marriage. There's a rough stretch coming. And if you're doing it on your strength, wow, God bless you. There's a rough stretch coming parenting your kids. I mean, there's going to be a moment when your teenagers grow horns and you want to send them back somewhere, but you can't figure who to return them to. There's a moment coming in your career where you're just going to think, I'm done. I'm done. I can't do this. Exactly. That's the point. I can't. He can. I'm out of strength. I have his strength. I'm out of joy. I can have his joy. If our focus is only the cross, we never experience the power and the joy and the strength that he gives us. How much strength? Check out the next verse. What is impossible with men is possible with God. I want you to write a little something in the side margin. I want you to write the phrase God thing. God thing. If there's not a God thing going somewhere in your life right now, something that defies explanation, something you look at it and say, I don't know how I'm hanging in there, but God's doing it. I don't know how I came through that, but God did it. I don't know how we're going to pay the bills this month. God's going to show up. I don't know how. It's God. Christ followers ought to be characterized by God things. Shouldn't be the exception. Ought to be the norm. I mean, if you can look across your life right now and not see where God is doing something you can't do, you're living on your own. Oh, you've done the cross, but you haven't done the empty tomb. It's like this awesome power source is available to us, and we're just going, nah, I'll just keep it back there for a crisis. Nah, I don't need it. I'm doing okay. Power for the impossible. Amazing. Look at the next verse. But you will receive power. I love how it defines it. Ability, efficiency, and might. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. For many of us, one of the hardest parts of the Christian life is talking to other people about Jesus. And really and truly, the thing that kind of freaks us out is how do you start the conversation? I mean, how do you get into that? There's somebody in your life you want to tell the good news to. There's somebody you want to just say, hey, let me tell you what God's doing in my life. And sometimes we're so intimidated, we don't have any power, so we don't go for it. Jesus says, I'll give you the power to talk about me. Power for joy, power for strength, power to talk about him. In fact, in another place, Jesus said, don't worry about what you're going to say. Open your mouth and I'll give you the exact words for that circumstance. Wow. An empowered life. But it's not just about talking the talk. It's also about walking the walk. Next verse. I have raised you up for this very purpose of displaying my power in you so that my name may be proclaimed the whole world over. Would you circle the word displaying? In our next series, we're going to be talking about how God's plan for the home is for it to be the display case for his love and his grace. God's plan for Christ followers is for me to be a display case of what God is doing. In other words, for my walk to match my talk. Now, here's the problem. Jesus said some things that are pretty rough. Love your enemies. That's not what first comes to my mind. Can I prove it to you? Missouri. <laughs> for some of you, K-State. For others, Kansas. And then for those who are truly doomed, Texas. <laughs> I mean, just even the names of college, colleges that we don't care for, we root against them because we root for another team. Love your enemies. Jesus says, pray for those who hurt you. Not my first response. He says, forgive those who deliberately insult you and abuse you again and again. Can I do that on my own? No. 
No, you want to be frustrated. Try to live the rules of this book without the power of a living Jesus. Try to do it on your own. I mean, there is a reason that many people turn away from following Christ. They see the standard and they say, I can't do it. And they never embrace that that's the very point. It is Christ in us who loves. It is Christ in us who forgives. It is Christ in us who prays for the people that hurt us. It is Christ in us, the scripture says, that is our hope of glory. That's our hope. It's that very deal. So it's power, power for joy, power for strength, power for talking about him, power for walking the walk. Why is that a big deal? Look at this verse in 1 Corinthians. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Hey, church, we have talked the world to death. We've talked them to death. We've tried to force feed them Jesus. We've told them you're headed to hell. We have absolutely beaten them up with our talk. And the reason it's not been effective is there's no walk. Nobody listens to the sermon I speak. Everybody listens to the sermon I live. Nobody cares about the God I describe with my words. They're looking for the God that lives in my life. And until it's embodied, that's the, the incarnation. That's why Jesus came. He came to show us what God in flesh looks like. Check this out. And now part of our job is the church to show the rest of the world what God in flesh looks like. What it means to walk the walk. I love this next verse. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid. Does not make us timid, but it's a spirit of power and of love. Power and love. That's the thing that Jesus says sets us apart. He talks all the way through the book of John about when I go, I'm going to send my spirit back, and he's going to give you power, love, words, truth, affirmation, encouragement, counsel. What's he saying? I've provided a way for you to live, not only in the light of the cross for salvation, but to live in the light of an open tomb for power for everyday living. This is a big thing. Write it in, please. We do not have the power to save ourselves. That is why Jesus went to the cross. I'm amazed at how many who think they are Christ followers are still confused about this. I regularly find folks when I talk to them that they'll say, you know, I'm just trusting that I've lived a pretty good life and God's going to take me in because I've been a pretty good guy. Really? I'd love to talk to your wife <laughs> or your husband or your kids and ask them, hey, is this guy good enough that he's impressed you and he's also going to impress God with his goodness? I mean, how do you impress God? That's pretty tough. Or people say, you know, I'm just trusting I haven't done any really major things wrong. You know, I'm not as bad as this guy, and I'm not as bad as that one. And I think heaven is going to be mine because uh, I I've done a pretty good job at it. Really? Or some folks who think they're working their way to heaven. If I just pray enough, and if I just do enough good, and if I just follow the rules, I'm going to get there. Jesus said it clearly. We are all short of God's standard. Scripture says it clearly. We are all sinners. Been around a two-year-old lately. Been around one? They're cute until they can't get their way. They want what they want, when they want it, and how they want it. They want it immediately. And if they don't get it, they scream and holler, and the terrible twos start. As far as I can tell, the terrible twos go all the way to 82. <laughs> because the only thing sadder to me than a two-year-old throwing a fit is a 42-year-old throwing one. Or a 22-year-old throwing one. Or fill in whatever two age you want to be. What's going on? 
what's going on is we've got to realize I can't do this on my own. I cannot gain heaven on my own. I cannot save myself. I cannot earn my way there or do good my way there or impress God to get me there. How big a deal was this to God? Pretty big deal. How much did he want you? Enough to give up his son. Enough to watch his son die. A slow and agonizing and painful death. But enough, three days later, to raise him. To send a little signal that said, Psst, I'm still God. I'm still in charge. I'm going to empower you just like I empowered him. If I can beat death, surely I can master life. If I can win over sin, surely I can empower you to see big things in your life. He is literally inviting us to say, I can't save myself. That's the message of the cross. It's the first act of Easter. It's huge. But the second half is equally important. Write it in. We do not have the power to live the Christian life. And that's why Jesus conquered the grave. I can't. He can. I couldn't. He did. I won't. He already has. The message of Easter is salvation in Jesus through a cross and power for living. Power to live it out. I want us to enter into a time of prayer. I know your notes are still going because we're going to come back in a minute and finish them. So hang on to them. But here's what we're going to do. I want us to spend the next few moments in an absolute spirit of prayer. I'm going to pray for us in just a moment. The band's going to come, and they're going to lead us in a musical piece that is also a seeking of God. And then I'm going to come back and pray a couple of specific prayers with you tonight. Finish the notes as well. But here's what I'm praying for right now. I'm going to ask God to show up and give us a new glimpse of the essence of Easter. A new picture of how much he loves us, which is the message of the cross. And a new picture of how much he wants to empower us, which is the message of an empty tomb. I'm going to ask you to pray with me right now. Would you bow your heads with me? Jesus, forgive me for being calloused about Easter, Lord. Forgive me for the moments that I have thought, well, hey, it's just Easter again, and I've been here before. Forgive me, Lord, for the ways I have not centered, both on your cross and on an empty grave. My prayer right now, Lord, is that in these next few moments, we would experience both your love and your power in a brand new, incredible way. Lead us to the cross. Lead us to the empty tomb. Grab your notes again, but keep that reflective mindset. I'm going to talk about one more truth, then we're going to have this time of prayer together. The essence of the gospel can be summarized in two simple words. Repent and believe. That's it. Repent and believe. Come to the place where you say, Jesus, I'm a mess, I'm a sinner. I can't do this on my own. I believe that you died for me. I believe you want to change me. I believe in you. In fact, it is simply repentance and belief that is the way we come to Christ. Would you write that in? But it is also the way we stay in Christ. The cross, the resurrection. We come to Jesus in salvation by repent and believe. We stay in Jesus to live a powerful Christian life by repentance and belief. Go ahead and put your notes away. But keep that same spirit of prayer. Prayer. 
just a moment, I'm going to lead a prayer out loud. Before we do that, let me explain it. There's a lot of ways to pray. Sometimes I pray with my eyes wide open, especially when I'm driving. Sometimes I bow my head in reverence. Sometimes I walk and just look at what God has done. There's nothing in the Scripture that says there's a right way to pray. But in large crowds, honestly, it is easier to focus on God sometimes when we're not visually distracted. So I'm going to ask you right now, if you would, to bow your heads and close your eyes. And we're going to go through a couple of times of prayer here. Just, just stay in that reverent, bowed spirit of prayer. If you're here tonight and you've never dealt with the cross, you've never settled the issue of salvation, you've never chosen to give your life to Christ, I have great news for you. Jesus said that if we believe in him, we would have eternal life. The scripture says, to as many as received him, he gave the right to become the children of God. So if you want to do that, you can simply pray in your heart the prayer I'm going to say out loud right now. Jesus, I need you. I want you. There's stuff in my life that I can't fix. There's things in my life that I've done that I know are wrong. Please forgive me. Thank you for dying for me. I ask you right now to save me. I ask you right now to come into my life. In this moment, Lord, as best I can, I'm committing everything I know about me to the little bit that I understand about you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for wanting me. I give myself to you. Now with everybody still just bowing your head and closing your eyes, if you prayed that prayer with me, would you just lift your hand and let me know? I just want to know that. Wow. That's awesome. Thank you, Jesus. There's a second prayer I want us to pray tonight, and I offer it to anybody who knows you're a Christ follower. You have dealt with the cross. You've settled your salvation. But like me, you find yourself trying to live it in your own power. You've been trying to do this thing called the Christian life on your own strength. If you want to recommit yourself to Jesus tonight, You can pray this prayer with me silently that I pray out loud. Jesus, I want you. And I need you. I'm certain of my salvation, Lord. But I've been living this thing on my own. And I can't do it. I'm tired of being powerless tired of seeing you work in moments and me take charge in the next so I ask you to take control I'm taking my hands off of me and I'm recommitting everything to you your boss you're in charge you're God and I'm not forgive me Lord for forgetting that I ask you to show up with power for joy and strength in the impossible. I love you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. Again, with us still praying, if you prayed that second prayer with me, would you let me know? Just raise your hand. Wow. Go, God. I want us to pray together and we'll finish this time of prayer. I'm going to voice a prayer for all of us.
thank you, Lord, in this holy moment for reminding us of what Easter's about. That it's about the cross and the fact you loved us. And it's about the tomb and the fact that you'll change us as we allow you to work in our lives. Help us stay focused on you, Lord. Not just tonight, not just tomorrow. Every day. Fill us. Use us. Empower us. Is our prayer in Christ. Amen. Would you look this way? Thank you for your reverence. In a little bit more meaningful way, why don't you turn to somebody now and tell them again, Happy Easter.